How are you? Doing, doing really real good. Well. Doing well. How are you doing, Jeffrey? Well, I'm great. Glad to see Scott too. I don't get to see him that often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is always great. Well, well, um, we've got to get uh, we've got to get Roger here in the room. Hey Cyrus, how are you doing? Ken, you got to get Roger in the room. Who let him take a break? <laughs> we'll have to talk about him behind his back until he gets here. So no, but a lot of things, you know, hey, what do you think, Jeffrey and Scott, while we're getting started here, you know, as Jerome Powell came out and spoke and markets, you know, up and down. What do you think so far about that? Well, um, I mean, the NASDAQ did exactly what I've been looking for the past couple of weeks. We are right at the level and, uh, you know, we held there all night right at the the top end of my expected target. And uh, then Jerome Powell starts talking and we pull back uh, to I, another it's, level. It, it's almost like classic, uh, you know, like what came first? Was it Jerome Powell or was it the market's reaction to the levels? I mean, uh, I have a hard time really distinguishing between the two um, when it comes out and the market reacts to news. Like, was it the news that made the reaction or was it the chart that was ready to react to whatever news hit? I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it's really a thing. And uh, I'll talk about the seasonality and how this all plays in too when we, we get more into my my segment here perfect perfect well yeah and that's what i was talking about you know the before everybody got here um to everybody that was here in the room you know those levels are so important in that 4200 level and how we pulled right back to that 4200 on the s p futures and i know it's a different uh, level on the spy so on and so forth but looking at those key levels that you're like you're talking about jeffrey is so key so let's get this going hey roger welcome oh hello everyone hey jeffrey celeste hey. Um, uh, Scott, how are you guys? Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I was finishing up my VIP room, but uh, hey. so glad to be here and happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. We're glad you're here. We'll let you slide a little bit there, Roger. So let's get this thing going. Let's find out some things. Scott, I want to hear from you too. I'm going to start with you first, Scott here. But first of all, you know, as with the, every week, there are a lot of headlines and we could unpack all of them. But week after week, what we're here to do, we want to increase our understanding and how we can take advantage of headlines like what even just happened with Jerome Powell in these markets using knowledge. In other words, how do we pull the trigger? How do we manage risk? How do we do all that? So today we want to talk Talk about equipping you and empowering you. Now, you know, there are no guarantees in the market and we are not making any guarantees. There is plenty of risk. You've experienced it. You know it. We're talking about it. It is your responsibility to make sure you understand whatever you are trading before you click that mouse because your money is at risk. You can lose a little bit. You can lose a lot of it. I know about both. So let's get going. And with, with all that, guys, all the headlines, Scott, let's start with you first. You know, we've got, you know, a hawkish Fed. We just heard about them. We've got debt ceiling going on, fights between Republicans and Democrats on that. We've got earnings. We got the NASDAQ dream team, you know, forgetting about everything. So, Scott, where is your focus right now and why? Well, uh, we've talked about it a couple of times on premium and, and when we've gotten together with all of our friends and bear markets last uh, on the average, how long? About nine and a half months. So we're well past that, right? So that number one is in the back of my mind. Again, it's just an average. It can last as long as it wants to last. I get it. But when I hear something like that, and it feels like, oh, we've been in a bear market for so long. Number one, that's on the top of my mind. And then you add in, you look at the charts, you look at the narrow ranges, and then you also look at the breathless headlines every day. No one we've been in a bear market for a while and the market's going to crash 50%. And then another person, no, it's going to crash 25%, but maybe for over and over and over again. And, and it's bearish, bearish, bearish. That is always, hmm, if everyone's bearish and we've been in a bear market for a long time, huh, what might happen? What might turn? And then, of course, a couple of days ago, Steve Cohen came out and said he's bullish. And Steve Cohen knows stuff. Right. I mean, yeah. wink. Anyway, so <laughs> I'd like a little bit of bullish. I don't want too much because I'd love to see it explode. But generally speaking, I just feel like everyone is waiting for an excuse. I think the debt ceiling is a lousy excuse, but I think it's an excuse. And I feel like, you know, today, notwithstanding in the last hour or so, I feel like traders are ready. So for me, how long we've been in the bear market, how bearish are all the experts and then go right to the charts. There you go. Love that. Roger, what are your thoughts? You know, everything going on. Where, where's your focus? 
Um, my focus right now is actually very defensive. I believe that a lot of what we've seen specifically the last week is a is a our our algo manipulations. I think we are about to reverse course and move in the other direction. And I think today I'm going to show you why. Interestingly, Scott, it, it started even before you mentioned it, because remember the small caps started started getting into a recessionary environment about a year before the large caps did. So if you yep. I just wanted to 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 just add another year to what you were saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two years. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been it has been a while. I mean, look at look at ARC. Look at look at when Kathy started getting bearish. That's really when it started. The small caps always start first. Yeah. So I, I I think it's even been longer than you've been saying. But I don't know if it's been see, I'm not so sure if all of that period qualifies under the typical recessionary or 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 inflationary period. I think I think may, only maybe in the last six months we really started hitting that where where the trajectory is really moving south in terms of Fed data and earning news because earnings revisions only started about nine months ago. So I do feel that technically you're right, but if you look at the small caps, it even it started way below that. So you're you're even more right than you than you <laughs> than you know. Um, but I I think right now I again and I'll again piggyback on what Scott says it. I think a lot of folks have been either looking for a big rally or for a big sell-off. I think, and I'm going to continue to be in this in this boat, I think the market, I think that the highest likelihood is the market not doing anything. We've actually seen a lot more evidence of that. Volatility on the Dow Jones. Let me just show you this. This is this is a cool little chart. I'll show you this very, very quickly before I even get into anything today. But just to kind of give you an idea of what I what I'm talking about. Look at the Dow Jones, right? This is the Dow Jones. And I'm just going to put one indicator on this. I'm going to put the ATR on it. And nothing else. And if you take a look at this, let me just delete this one here. If you delete this and if you look at the volatility, let me make this a little smaller so everybody could see this. Okay, here we go. So let's go. So right here, right around here, the volatility on the Dow Jones, the movement was 727 points per day on average. And then it kind of peaks out again here at 670. We went all the way from about 749 points on the Dow, and everybody here is going, yeah, I remember those days. We're now at about 360. So volatility on the Dow has declined in half. And notice this trading action right here, the sideways. And so when you have volatility, but you don't have a lot of directional bias, it, it, it tends to be more of a choppy, non-eventful market. So from where I'm sitting, I'm seeing a lot more boring, defensive, lackluster market right after these six stocks that have been taking us higher revert back, which are the FANG stocks. And I'll talk about that in depth when I do my segment. But uh, I'm seeing more choppiness, more consolidation, and a very boring summer. That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> boring can be very good. Yes, boring so can be good. Jeffrey, you were talking when we first got started about levels and things that you were watching. And uh, but back to the question too, with you know all the headlines, everything that's going on with that can be distracting in trading. Uh, do you have anything to add to you know where is your focus? Well, I mean, right now I was focused on Nasdaq rallying to the August high, and that happened yesterday. We got to that level, we kind of poked up through it, and we've stopped there. I mean, that was. Kind of what I expected to happen and uh, that kind of level. So what's the focus now is on waiting for the next high probability setup. We had a high probability setup for that NASDAQ to rally to that level. Once we got there, there's not there's not another <laughs> – the next thing is not clear. Um, that's, that's key for me right now. And S&P 500 has been lagging. It was not participating in that rally. It has opportunity to catch up, but it's not a high probability setup to catch up. It doesn't have to. Um, these are a lot of things that people don't seem to necessarily grasp is that, oh, NASDAQ rallied, S&P has to go too. No, it doesn't. Even though two major components of NASDAQ, Microsoft and Apple, make up what, you know, like 13, 20, you know, whatever, you know, double digit percentage of the S&P 500, that's, there's still... 498 other companies in the S&P 500 that, you know, weigh it down. <laughs> 27% then, to be specific, Jeffrey. 27%. 27%. Okay. 27 right now. Yeah. The change changes by the day. So, um, 
you know, I guess Apple's 13, Microsoft's, you know, 14, whatever, 27 together. Craziness when you look at that. But the other 498 companies out there, you know, taking up that other 63% or whatever the crazy, I mean, you know, those companies have the opportunity to go too if the money flows, but we have to wait for the money to flow. And right now everybody's waiting for this bear market crash and it just puts us in a stalemate. The market has, it was very efficient at fleecing the most number of people it can. Yeah. If majority of people are bearish and then so the other remaining people are bullish, what's the most likely scenario? Just holding sideways, like Roger said. And, uh, you know, if I share my chart here, go ahead and take it from Roger here for a second. And I have the NASDAQ seasonality here. Now we're, we're in this last little potential rally here in May and coming up in June, probably some chop, probably not go anywhere, you know, which agrees with what Roger's saying. Even, you know, our big tech, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, fangs, oh, everything's going to pop. You know, we're breaking out. Like I've seen the breakout story so many times today, breaking out of that August high. It, it may not go anywhere. It may just lead to volatility. And we have right now for the level on the S&P 500, which, you know, it has some seasonality of going sideways too here, a little bit of rally into the end of May and then sideways with some bigger volatility in June. Um, you know, that S&P 500, the volatility has been pushed down in the toilet. Like it's uh, when we actually look at the seasonality and the volatility for May, we typically bottom out in May and then see volatility spikes into June, into early June, and then into late June. So we can see that volatility creeping back in the market. If you're trying to play bull put spreads, like zero day option bull put spreads on SPX is super popular right now. Be careful. The volatility may come and get you on that downside. Now, the way that VIX is priced with S&P 500, it's um, priced off the front months and the options. And uh, so to create a VIX spike, the basically the market has to go down. Uh, we call it increased volatility. That's increased realized volatility and in increased implied volatility. We've got to see a move down to really get that. We can have volatility on the upside, but the VIX won't respond and won't pay you as well on volatility to the upside. So this is in um, this 20 year average right here on the VIX is suggesting that maybe we see increased downside volatility in the S&P 500 as we move into June. That's something to keep in mind with your positioning and be careful. I've been beating the drum for two days now to be careful after we hit that NASDAQ high. And uh, I, I just, I, I can't say it enough times <laughs> the last couple of days is like, be careful. The market does not have to do anything in particular right now. Be yeah. careful getting overly bullish. Be careful getting overly bearish. Be careful playing tight iron condors because volatility can increase and get you even though we don't go anywhere. What in your opinion then, Jeffrey, is a, a good way to play the scenario that you're laying out for us? Well, right now I've added some protectionary trades to take advantage of volatility increasing. Um, the, the way I've done that is I've gone into a, a very easy, light, low risk SQQQ position. And I'm looking for uh, some positions in SVXY which uh, is short VIX and tends to respond in a leveraged way and doesn't decay like UVXY or VXX. So um, I'm looking at possibly adding some put positions in SVXY, which is kind of like an inverse of an inverse. <laughs> mm -hmm. So SVXY goes up when the market volatility goes down. And uh, so v SVXY will drop while uh, VIX spikes. So kind of counterintuitive a little bit to play the puts on, on something like that. But it is a leveraged instrument and playing options on a leveraged instrument is highly dangerous. Be careful if you do that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Some really good words, really well said there. Uh, Jeffrey, one other question for you, and then I'll move over to you, Scott. But, you know, you mentioned a lot of things, you know, like looking at seasonality. You've talked about VIX. You've talked about different levels and everything. There's a lot to know in the markets. What would you say is one area of knowledge that traders should have? Well, um, is it, okay, my big thing, uh, I'm, a, I'm a technical trader and that focusing on the news can get you in trouble. That's the biggest thing. Uh, it's probably the biggest lesson it took me years to learn. Just focusing on news will get you in trouble because the market doesn't react to news. It reacts to the levels, 
and the news that comes out just may or may not support or conflict with, uh, you know, who hadn't been in a trade and the earnings come out. They were just like you thought, but the stock does the exact opposite thing you were positioned for. I mean, we've seen it over and over. You know, everybody warns about playing earnings because it's so dangerous like that. It's because the news doesn't make the charts. And that's my biggest takeaway in uh, thing is if you can separate your mind from the news and focus more on the charts and the levels, I think you can do a lot better. And politics too. <laughs> well, polit I mean, that's <laughs> politics is news to me. <laughs> that's a good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. We have one TV in our house. That should tell you how much news we watch that. Uh, let me let, I want to find out some more from you, uh, Scott, and then we're going to go to Roger. And, but before I dive into some questions I have for you, Scott, specifically, well, how would you answer that question? What's one area of knowledge that if, if there was just one area of knowledge that traders should have, what would it be? What is it? Uh, for me, it's technical and there is nothing else. I started as a fundamental trader and I read all the Warren Buffett books and I love value investing more than anything, but um, technical, learn a simple technical system that's rule-based and that will save you more than anything else I've found so far. There, there's a lot more advanced, but man, for something that's enduring, for me, it's technicals. Love that. Well, simplicity is is a word that I'm hearing there. And uh, oh, yeah, that's something that we have to preach. A lot of times people, traders, we make it more difficult than it needs to be. And a lot of that has to do probably with fear or a bunch of different reasons. But that's not the topic of this Ask the Pro session. Let's keep going. I want to find out, Scott, you know, tell us more about how you're looking at the markets right now, you know, and 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 what has your interest and how this process has worked out for you, say, like over the past six months since we were talking about that, six, seven months, a year, whatever. How's it worked out? Well, let's take a look, shall we? Oh, first I got to share. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There. Always have to share. Be nice. Yes. <laughs> slide, slideshow. You need to move. Slideshow from beginning. Okay. How about that? Perfect. Love okay. it. Um, we're going to talk with every time I'm on, we talk about this because uh, the Weinstein model, because uh, I find it a very simplified, enduring, long term way to look at the markets. It's extremely boring, doesn't take any fundamental analysis, but I like it that way. Right. <laughs> um, and I'll, I've explained it before, but we want to buy in stage one and stage two, which is right over here. This is a long-term moving average on a weekly chart. It's a 30. We want to trade when it's breaking above the 30 or on pullbacks of the 30. Okay. I won't spend a lot of time on that. However, when we've gotten together, I've also taken this and gone one step more boring. I hope everyone falls asleep as I talk about this, but this is a monthly <laughs> right, chart. It. Wake up monthly chart. I love it. <laughs> and it's 12 to 12. What does that mean? Of course I built a robot for it, right? Cause I'm an algo technical trader. This is the 12 month moving average. You get it, you enter when it closes monthly, closes above the 12, simple moving average. You get out when it closes below the 12, simple moving average. And it has to close twice above. So one is not enough, not enough proof. That's the robot. And this is an automated hypothetical trade from Amazon. I, yeah, pretty good company. I've heard good things about Amazon. Yeah. And so there's two closes and then you don't, what are you doing? Well, you can watch the news all you want, but you're doing nothing. And then it closes and you get out, all right? So I took Weinstein and I made it a robot and I made it an even more boring robot, okay? There is uh, a few more trades over the years. Huh, wow, it seems to do okay on Amazon, crazily enough. And this is, if again, we can do it better. You could have a different profit target, stop losses, all that. We can make this better, but we're keeping it simple. And this is the equity curve. In the dot-com crash, it didn't do great. But since then, that's a 60,000 starting at 20,000. Just doing this boring monthly system, and it does it on Apple and many other stocks too, which is why I'm interested in looking at the markets this way. So it's boring. It's long-term. But here's something even more interesting. This goes back to the 1960s. Same system, you can see the SPX because it has the most data, it's the longest data I can find. From January 1960 to 2023, this is an equity curve that seems to be rising. Now, I understand buy and hold will get there too, 
but using a system has way less drawdown than buy and hold. And we can talk about that some other time. So what is long-term? To me, this is very long-term, which is why, again, I'm interested in it. Now, I've been on in April a couple of times talking about PLTR. And if you put this boring system on it, and we did it on the, we've talked about it on the weekly, we've talked about it on the monthly, we talked about it above the simple moving average, breaking above 920, 925, it might be a trade. And yes, it's at the $11 level, at least when I made this chart earlier. So a very boring way to look, but it did break out. Do I think it should break out? Do I think the market should go up? In my heart, no, but it broke out. The charts know more than me. The charts have been through more than I have. So I trust them. And here it is on a monthly. That was the weekly. This is the monthly. Again, a break above 920 would have gotten you here. This will be a trade at the start of next month if you care about trading a robotic, silly, boring system, right? So that's almost a trade. Uh, I wrote about in the free email about DraftKings, two closes above. Started writing about this back in April also. So the robot would have bought it here. I mean, I don't know why gambling stocks and leisure stocks are going up. I don't think they should go up. We have a huge inflation, but what I say doesn't matter. A buy here would have you nicely in profit. I mean, you'd have to trail the stop. We can talk about that some other time, but I wrote about it. I said it could go and it went. Churchill Downs, right before the Kentucky Derby. I was writing about this back in March, April. It was a close right around this time, January, February. You could have traded a breakout. I mean, why, is, why are horse racing stocks going up? But they are, um, at least for now. So anyway, that's what's happened. Here's a couple that may happen soon. I buy, I've talked about, it's an ETF. You don't ever have to look around. It's just online retail. It went from 60 to 140. If you would have bought after two closes above, again, this didn't get out to here, but you could have gotten out here because you're smarter. Missed the bear market and it might be getting ready soon. So that put that on your list. Oh, Tesla, good little car stock. This simple boring system, two closes above the simple moving average would have gotten you in at 22 and gotten you out at 286. I guess that's pretty decent performance, I think. Would have missed the entire bear market. Tesla, oh, the news, Tesla's bullish, but it's not close to this. So I don't care about Tesla news right now, but could be a big one again. Here is Neo, a Tesla's competitor. That went from what? four dollars to 37 dollars just buying on two closes above not a trade yet but something you can put on your radar for the future here's xlf oh the banks bank crisis well it's trades coming soon we need two closes above this one isn't a, a screamer like the ones but if you like bank stocks it's not ready yet but it could be ready in a couple months right when everything calms down this one, I just get laughed at and don't listen to a word I say about Carvana. What a ridiculous company is not making it's, it's so many bad things about Carvana, but it got in around 60 and it would have gotten out around 300 just by trading this. The bear market, it missed it all. But look at this little green. Is Carvana coming back? I mean, it's on my radar. I'm going to watch it. I don't know for sure. TQQQ, full disclosure, I am actually in this one. I followed my own system and I'm in this one and I'm in profit. Did okay in 2020, two closes above. It went for about a 200% gain on the ETF. I know this is 3X and it's dangerous and nobody should ever trade it, but I'm just showing it to you because I like to share. Here's the QQQ, that's actually a buy. I did TQQQ instead of QQQ, but you couldn't do either. QQQ is more normal. Made 48% on a break back in the pandemic times. And we're a spy. Spy is ridiculous. It should go down. Roger's right. Jeffrey's right. But gosh darn it, <laughs> it's a close. Now, they could stop out easily, right? It could go side. It could do nothing. I don't think the spy should go up, but it's actually just turned into a buy in May. So we could put our stop right below the low. We could put our stop below the simple moving average. But I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> the, the spy, according to the numbers, is a buy. So that's what I'm looking at. That's what's been working past few months. And we've got some things to put on the radar. Excellent. Hey, Scott, I, 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 uh, Celeste, if you don't mind, I just want to sure. clarify something here. Yeah. Can you go to the, the Amazon one real quick? Yeah. And show me, you, you said you had a P&L on the Amazon one. No, it was an equity curve. Yeah, the equity curve. Can you? Yeah. So you started in 2020 and you ended in 2023 and you made, you went from 20, you made three times your money. 2000, started at 2000. 
and you tripled your money, right? Yeah. Now, but Amazon was Amazon was at a dollar fifty in two thousand, and it went up to a hundred and seventy five dollars in twenty twenty. In twenty twenty three, it was actually a hundred. So if you bought and hold, you would have been up a hundred times your money. A million percent more. That's correct. Yes. But it right. okay. All right. The, I just the wanted difference to make sure. is, could, <laughs> and and I can make and the algos that I look at. I can almost always be buy and hold, not with magic optimization, but just be using some simple fundamentals, not fundamental fundamentals, but basics of you know testing and in, in sample out of sample that sort of thing. But the difference is who can hold Amazon when it goes down 85%. That's the key. You know, you can buy and hold and make 10,000%, right? Amazon is the number one stock of, of since the 19, late 1990s. It's number one. It's the granddaddy of them all. But my argument is I need to, I need to trade it because I could, I could never make it through 85% down. I'd love it when it went 10,000% up, but so that's the difference between trading and algo buy and hold will beat it on something like Apple and Amazon from 2000 on, or, you know, whatever. But for me, algo trading is, gives me the discipline and lets me control my drawdown, but you're, oh, I, agree, right. I, I agree with you. It's just, I, I was just happening to look, I was like, he's, I think he beat everybody except, except Amazon. Amazon was like <laughs> it, because it went like from a buck to like $1,750. So I don't know about algos on that one, but everything else, but everything else, I could see your point. And I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on it. I'm just playing devil's advocate. I'm, I'm yeah. a, I'm a 100%. Well, yeah. This one since 2003 ish would have been great, but yeah, it, it, it took some losses during, right. Cause the system's not perfect. Yeah. So yeah, definitely yeah. Uh, did not like the dot com, but it didn't go down 85%. So that, no, that's no. Good. Well, that's the thing. And people are typing in too, you know, and, and to your point, Scott, I mean, holding that, uh, in those big drawdowns, that's really something else. And do you use options on these, uh, on, on your trading, Scott? Well, someone who's super smart and knows options, absolutely. You could take these signals and just buy a long dated option and you can make a lot more. Yes, I'm doing it, like I said, the most boring possible way. It, yeah, but, good. Well, so yeah, that uh, that's the key too. Can you go back to one of your other charts because there's some questions about about the uh, the the exits, the entries and the exits. You know, the two month or the the two closes on your 12 month moving average. Could you uh -huh. repeat kind of what you said about you know entries exits on using sure. that uh, two months of uh, on your 12 month moving average? Yeah, sure. I just don't want to take anyone else's time, so I went kind of fast. So sorry. This is the <laughs> Weinstein curve, right? <laughs> that looks just like all I did was build a robot and I didn't want one close. I just wanted more than one close. So that's, I didn't optimize this at all. I didn't pick 12 with optimization. I just picked it out of my brain. Um, so here you have the 12 month simple moving average. You need price to close, not touch, but close. So it needs to close above. Then it needs to close above again. And then you buy at the open of the next bar, which is a monthly bar. So you wait two months, hey, hey, we got a signal. And then you would buy at the open of the next month. And then you could trail that stop. Like I said, there are better ways to do it, I'm sure. But then you would just wait for a close below the 12 again, and you could get out at the open of the next bar that way. Does that make yeah, sense? What, I, what I'm hearing this you is say really is- excellent. I want to say something here really quick if I can, because what I love about this, and this is what everybody here needs to understand. Yeah, these are long-term trades and these are using different timeframes. I mean, this, this is a monthly time frame. We're not talking about a daily chart. We're not talking about a 30 minute. We're not talking about a weekly. We're talking about monthly. And I love this. This has been key to my success, Scott. So thanks for pointing this out for really being confident of long-term moves. I love it, love it, love it. And there's a there are multiple, multiple ways. And you're, I know, Scott, you're just scratching the surface of the ways people can use this. And with options and that option knowledge, whoo, I mean, yeah. it's really good stuff. Mm -hmm. So really good stuff. Yeah. Sorry, Jeffrey, go ahead. No, what I was going to say is this, uh, you know, you guys were touching on the drawdowns and the pullbacks and like that really cuts out the fear, the uncertainty, the doubt that you get riding through a bear market. If you can just sit out and wait, um, you know, maybe your your reward is not as great, but uh, you're sweating, your, your, your nights of not sleeping, they're definitely cut down and reduced a lot. And, uh, yeah, that's that's one of the key things. Psychologically, you're going to second guess yourself if you're sitting there going, oh, my gosh, I'm down 50%. I'm down 30, 40%, 50, 50, 60. Oh, my gosh, I got to sell this. And then you watch it turn right when you sell. Um, yeah, if, if you just follow a system, it, it cuts out a lot of that. There's <laughs> a great I, phrase I, that 
it works in athletics. You know, as a tennis teacher for a long time, but it works in athletics and it works in trading. You don't fit your life around your trading system. You fit your trading system into your life. So if you cannot handle drawdown, then you could, you would say, I'm going to give up 10,000% to make 700% or whatever, right? Because sitting through that drawdown peacefully is way better than buying and holding a scene and going down 80%. Either way is fine, but you need to decide what do you like, and then your system has to follow that. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. Don't change the rules on it. You know, you're looking at these monthlies. Don't be changing the rules. It changes everything, right? Yeah. Yep. The, the so. system has to fit you. Um, just a comment about the options because I do trade options pretty much all the time. That's what we do, and uh, I actually would not. I'm going to say that again. I would not recommend options with Scott's system because. What happens is you really don't know how long the trend is going to last. And some of these trends can last for multiple years and you can have a drawdown periods the last months. So what's going to happen with options is you're going to end up buying a lot of options and having a lot of them expire. And it's going to add to your cost because you're looking for big, 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 big moves here. And I mean, big moves, a simple approach would be just buying less shares. You don't have to have a lot of shares. These kind of moves can, I mean, look at these moves on Amazon from $80 to $150 in one shot. So you don't need to have a lot uh, leaps. You're, you're leaving a lot of money on the table in terms of, uh, I, I know that it sounds good, but take it from somebody who's been doing this for almost 30 years. Sometimes option transactions sound a lot sexier than they are in real life. You know, there's a lot of things that come with them that a lot of people don't. It's like owning a plane. It sounds sexy till you figure out the gas cost, the maintenance. There's a lot of there's the biggest reason why people don't own airplanes is because of all the stuff that comes with it. So I'm telling you, there's yeah. a lot of hassles that come with options when you're planning a trade for two years. Yeah, it's just, it you're picking on my you picking on my airplane ownership. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I didn't even know you have an, an airplane or you had an airplane. But um, but seriously, like like if you talk, I know a lot of people who had airplanes and I'm going to say or boats. And it's like, let me guess, the, see, when they buy boats, they don't think about the fuel cost. Fuel for boats is very, very expensive. OK, a lot of people just don't take that into account. Storage costs for airplanes. Very, very I know a family that bought two airplanes, one to rent out and one to fly very wealthy family, and uh, they hated it. Everyone I know who had a plane sold it. Everybody, unequivocally. Yeah. Uh, T-Bus had an airplane and he sold it, actually, now <laughs> that I right. think about it. Yeah, er so it's like some things sound better than they are, yeah. and there's a lot of really great things to do with options, but I would go with Scott's approach here. I would go with a more pure approach, have less shares, have a headache, because you just don't know how long you're going to be holding these things for. It can be held for like a year or two. And if you buy options that expire every six months and you have to reinvest, it can become very costly and offset a lot of those gains. So I'm just yeah. giving you- I'm Thanks giving for that. You, I'm, Thanks I'm telling for that clarity. You I want to jump in here a little bit too. Thanks yeah. for that clarity on that, Roger, too, because what Roger brings up a really good point, and that is y'all need to ask questions. Y'all need to really know what is being talked about and never make assumptions, you know? So like, and like when I'm talking about timeframes, I mean, like that kind of a skill of being able to see a longer term time frame and kind of see overall, like maybe an Amazon is more longer term long. You use these finer tuned, uh, finer tuned timeframes, the dailies, the 30 minutes, the weeklies to really kind of get to zero in on the, the swing trading. So we're talking about, yeah, very, very different things. So y'all need to ask questions because there's a lot of different answers to the different types of trading that you can do. And it can get confusing, which is why too, Roger, I'm really excited. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag a little bit because you're going to talk a little bit about options in a smart, smart way to use options. And that's what I really want people to hear. So, but anyway, before we get to that, Roger, I want to find out because, because Scott was also talking about all algos. We've heard a lot about algos. I know you know a lot about algos. I know that they're in there. They're like these little, you know, varmints that are in the market causing all kinds of havoc. So tell us, you know, what's going on right now that we need to know about algos and also what other things are you looking at? What's going on, you know, in the market that we need to know? Celeste, I'm stealing that. Vermin's in the market, <laughs> crawling around. I'm loving this. This is great. This is this is. But you're right. You're 100 right. That's exactly what they are. They're like nuance, new gremlins. Yeah, there's nuisances. <laughs> That's so, and like trying to try just just 
you know, I used to live in Beverly Hills and when we lived there. It was like uh, we had, there was golf courses everywhere. And I lived four blocks away from a golf course. There was uh, those um, not ferrets. What are they? The the things that go under underground and you, you just oh, yeah. step in it. Moles. Moles or stuff like that. And you would just Brown step house. in a hole. <laughs> right. You'd step in a hole and uh, and your leg would just it, it was very, very it was uh, it wasn't fun. I'm going to tell you, it was not fun. And now I live on a golf course, but I guess I guess we we have those nets, Florida rooms here, so they they can't come in. But Gophers, that's it, Gophers. Oh, there there was so tons knows, of, yeah. there were so many Gophers there. It was amazing. I almost broke my ankle three times living there. Anyways, funny stories from the past. So I want to talk. You know, the, the the topic of this of this story that I'll talk about should be called "Algo's Gone Wild" because I'm going to tell you these suckers have gone wild. Now, algos can't manipulate too much, but one of the indicators that I'm finding that they've that that seems to work really well with spotting these big big algo plays is is using a is using a five day RSI. It's actually working out really well, and you could see that right now the five day RSI is the highest it's been. I'm going to say this again: it's the highest it's been since October, November of 2021. I mean, look at this thing. This is insane. I mean, this is this is craziness. What's even more craziness? Ninety percent of this move, and and I say, and I'm going to show you some cool stuff here. Ninety percent of this move is caused by these rascals right here: Microsoft, Apple. I think Jeffrey was talking about market cap. Jeffrey, if you're interested, they're right here. You could get literally real time market cap for all of them. But look at this: Tesla, not Tesla. Sorry, Meta, Google, Nvidia. Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. I mean, look at the charts of all of them right now. I mean, it's not a coincidence. Trust me, they're not all fundamentally doing exactly the same thing. But look at these charts. The stocks that I just mentioned, the five or six stocks that I just mentioned, are literally responsible for, for about 40% of the market cap in the QQQ. Look at this. That's Microsoft. Look at NVIDIA. And they're and the five day RSI is popping like wild on all of them. Look at this thing, look at the, and then look at the five day RSI. It's going crazy. Uh, look at Amazon. I mean, we're not going to go through many. There's only five of them, and Meta and Google. I think that's it. Look, Amazon all making swing highs. Google. Look at that. Look at this thing. And uh, and and Meta, they're they're all going wild, folks. This is classic, classic algo moves. Uh, algos have shifted move from shifted assets in the last week from defensive assets like consumer staples, uh, healthcare, and they've shifted them into these six stocks. Now it's very hard for the algos to run amok and manipulate the entire QQQ. That would be a little. I mean, you, it's hard to do that for more than say day and a half. But they can take these five or six stocks and they can just go crazy on them and make them go parabolic like this, trigger some stops. All you have to do is trigger some stops here and just watch them go. The problem is these momentum levels cannot stay long. And let me prove to you, I'm going to prove to you that this is limited in one click of a mouse. I'm going to prove to you that this is limited to just those six stocks. This is the equal weighted NASDAQ 100. Now, let's take away all that stuff. Look at how it looks right now in comparison. Does it look like it's running wild to you at all? Does it look like it's running among? This is stripping all that market cap away. This is making them all equal weighted right now. Matter of fact, now that I think of it, I can take this now and move this up here and make a channel out of it. It'll probably top out somewhere right over here. But the, the, the point is, this thing is not ready to go higher. And if you take those stocks away, if you take the um, here uh, NAS, Nasdaq, there's it, there's an index. Hold on, it's an index. I want to give you a ticker symbol. It's uh, Nasdaq. It's the Nasdaq without here. Uh, no, it's the Nasdaq without the tech part in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had it. Does anybody remember what it is? I had it here a while, just a little bit ago. Is it NDXX Bodine typed in? NDXX. Yeah. There it is. That's it. Thank you. I just had it Bodine. in. Thank Way you. Go. Thank Ooh. you, Bodine. I just had it in my in Bodine. my previous. 
Okay, so here's the Nasdaq without without the tech. Does this look does this look to you like like something that's raging? Does that look to you like a runaway market? That looks to me like real estate. It looks to me like basic materials. It looks to me like industrial. It looks to me actually consumer staples looking a hell of a lot better. Uh, maybe healthcare, but it's not looking to me like these three, like technology, communications. Or technology has four out of those five uh, FANG stocks. They make up four out of 35 to 50 stocks. They make up four. So out of 100 stocks you have in the QQQ, here you have less of a delusion. So it's even a more of a – and here you have Google and Meta, and I think one more in the communication. And consumer discretionary is not even pretending to top that. It just it can't even fake it. My point is – Technically, right now, looking at what the algos are doing, looking at the fact that the five-day RSI is at a uh, at a huge level, technically, these things look like they're grossly overbought. But I'm not even halfway done yet. Let's talk about this fundamentally now. And I, I showed this earlier today in my VIP room. I want to show you guys something. This is the PE ratio. This is the PE ratio right now. So now we're, we just looked at everything technically, and you know where I stand technically. But fundamentally, can you see this? Uh, can yes. you see this, Celeste? Okay. Yep. It's a pretty cool color. This is the Very P cool. ratio. Th this is the P ratio on the on the QQQ. And a year and a half ago, we went to thirty, almost went to thirty-five. But now it's a thirty. But I'm going to tell you, it's not really a thirty. Here's where it really is. Let me just delete this. If you adjust everything, remember, right when when when. When we had it at 35, interest rates were at 0.25. Can you interest make that bigger? Rate, yes, I can, and I will. Yeah. Uh, if I can, let's see. it. Yep, there, there we, go. we go. Okay, so this is reality. This is reality. This is adjusted for the current inflationary pressure. Nice. So remember, interest rates were 0.25. Interest rates now are at 5.25. Tech is not weighted the same way. So right now we're at we're equivalent. If you were to do the math, we're equivalent at about thirty nine PE ratio. That, folks, I got news for you. That's the highest we've been since two thousand eight. That's higher than we've been in two thousand eight. Now, were we expecting in twenty twenty one October of twenty twenty one when we were here, we were ex we were still expecting earnings to be up ten to twenty percent at a clip. Earnings revisions weren't negative till 2022. Now, we're not expecting 15 to 20%. Nutshell, stocks are trading like it's 2020, 2021 again, and it's, and it's not. And interest rates are not zero. And somebody forgot to tell these stocks that. So fundamentally and technically, these things look horrific. They look really, really bad. They don't look good at all. They don't look good at all. So that's the first thing I wanted to tell you. This is what the NASDAQ really looks like, okay? It's not rocking and rolling, and it's not really looking like that when you take away literally five stocks, okay? Mm -hmm. This is – without the five stocks, you're not going to get a trend like that. You're going to get it you're, – you're still like right here. And right now, by the way, a momentum levels in the QQQ, you have 60, 64% trading above the 50 and the 20-day moving average, not 90, not 100 like the, the index looks. So it's, 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 it's fake news. It's a mirage. It's an aberration. Don't fall for the banana in the tailpipe, okay? That's what this is in the biggest way possible, okay? So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. Number two, I want to talk about the retail sales report that came out earlier this week. We had a, a retail sales report, and I know you guys usually get the headline number, and the headline number doesn't take away, it doesn't separate everything. But if you, I remember on this show about a year ago, I was predicting that food prices were going, food was going to become more and more scarce, and uh, food prices are going to stay higher and higher. So I want to tell you something about this. Retail sales rose less than expected in April. But the grocery store category stood out with a 0.4% decline between March, April and March, and only 3.7% year over year. Higher prices have been masking a notable drop in volume for many grocery stores. And analysts have been pointing out to higher prices and shrinkflation as a reason consumers may be altering their habits. The point is people are uh, 
consumers are. And after this report, we had a report from Target. Now, Target said something very, very interesting. Actually, what's interesting, it was completely the opposite of what happened last year this time when Target gave us a big negative surprise. Target said that people are, in fact, spending money, but they're not spending money for TVs or stuff like that. They're, they're spending money more on groceries there. People have moved from Albertsons, Ralph's, whatever uh, whatever your, the name of your supermarket chain is in the, in the, in the city you live in. They have different names, but – People are starting to shop a lot more for things that they need in stores like Dollar General, Walmart, Target. Um, I know my in-laws, they buy their groceries in Walmart. They don't even go to markets. Food is actually cheaper in those things. And shopping habits of people have moved a lot more from things that they want to things that they need. So I'm seeing a lot higher pressure in and a lot more upside in stores like Walmart, Target, and Consumer Staples as opposed to consumer discretionary. So we've had that news now from Target and we've had it from the Fed data. There's a, there's a shift that's happening right now and you gotta be very, very mindful. So keep your eye on potential short opportunities in stock like Sprout Markets. Those are luxury discounts. Those are luxury stores where people buy things that they uh, like, uh, what's the other one that owned by Amazon, um, which isn't good for Amazon. Whole Foods. Am Whole Foods. People will be spending less money in places like Whole Foods, Sprout Markets, uh, Kroger, uh, for example, and a lot more money in places like like uh, like like Target and uh, and and Walmart and Dollar General and Dollar Tree. And I'm expecting those stocks to continue moving. But the bottom line is, don't don't let this shake off in XLP, which is the consumer staple sector dissuade you from these type of stocks because where the economy is going right now, these stocks are looking really, really good. And I think there's going to be some strong support nearby and we're going to get an opportunity to bounce uh, on these stocks. That's why I'm looking at stocks like uh, Procter Gamble, Hormel uh, stocks, uh, Clorox, things that are really like kind of stocks that were in short supply during COVID. I think you got to start looking at the market, especially if we have more recessionary pressure coming our way. And lastly, there are two chip stocks that I, I'm really liking right now, and I want to talk to you guys about them. Now, everybody loves NVIDIA, and I'm, I like NVIDIA too, but folks, AMD, remember, one of the biggest growth stocks in the last 20 years has been AMD. Uh, Domino's, if you look at a 20-year chart of AMD, you'll see this thing. I mean, this, this may be one of those stocks that would have done, been a perfect example for what Scott was showing us earlier today, actually. But AMD is one of those stocks. Now, in uh, in in May of 2022, they co completed a 1.9 million dollar billion dollar acquisition of distributed computer startup Pensando Systems, and uh, the stock popped over six percent last June. They talked about an opportunity in data analysis centers, and uh, that that uh, that market is now worth about 300 billion dollars. They're predicting improved profit margins, free cash flow. They're taking way, way a lot of market cap from Intel. Don't tell my father that. He's a big fan of Intel. But uh, their desktop processor sales are up 18.6% last quarter. Their notebooks are up 20%. And they're doing a lot of things with uh, Microsoft right now and with AI. They're trying to follow in NVIDIA's footsteps. So I like the stock a lot. I think they're going to pull back up to the probably the $90 level. But uh, then I believe they're going to go higher, and I think the stock is going to see some higher highs. The other chip stock I really like simply because they've been doing everything really well. And I would call this a blue chip. This would be like a, a blue chip chip stock. Their multi PE ratio is not very high right now. Their price is looking really good. They're implying in their price about a 10% upside from where they're at right now. Now, I wouldn't be buying this stock right now. I'd be waiting for a pullback to the 500, low 500 levels. But I think over time, we're, we could see the stock go up to the $700 level uh, in a very, very quick way. Now, before I let you guys go, Celeste was right. I've got something to talk about. Is it okay to talk about it, Celeste? Go for it, please. We need to know. I I've got something very exciting for you guys. Now, unlike a lot of folks here, I've been involved in the options market for about 29 years. Now, what if there's a way to 
spent half, half on every option you buy, or roughly half, sometimes more than half. Seriously, what if there's a way to take a $3 Apple option and pay only $1.50? Not only are you going to get a better deal, but you have to let make less money on the upside to justify your trade. Because to make 20% on $3, you have to go from $3 to $3.60. But to, on a on a on a dollar fifty option, it only has to go to $1.80, which isn't very much. Same strike price, same expiration, but half the price. Half the price, I tell you. You would simultaneously be able to increase your upside potential, decrease your risk to the downside. And Matt and I, my assistant, he's in the lab, busy. I keep him very busy in the lab working there. We've been testing out some strategies. And we've unlocked something that will literally show you how to buy exactly the option you want for half the price. No tricks, no monkey business. And none of that banana in the tailpipe stuff either. We just recently closed out a trade, a 35% gain on FedEx. And it almost became a free trade of the last few days we had it. It was, it was doing so well. It, it, I'm going to teach you literally how to, how to have your cake and eat it too. $1,000 into $1,350 in just a few days while cutting our risk in half, more than half actually, by about 60% on that trade. Now, I'm planning on doing this on another stock next week. Actually, I want to invite you to join me on a master class. And I want to teach you all about this calendar phenomena that I've been working on. It's called Discount Options Unlocked. Who wouldn't love that? Here's what you can expect. Um, we're going to do it in two sessions. Celeste, you're invited. Yeah. Uh, I hope you're going to make it. Absolutely. Bring your notepad. It'll be recorded. Uh, anybody who's not there, it'll be three to four hours total in two sessions. What this discount calendar option is, the upside of using it, how to select the discount calendar option, best way to initiate it and liquidate the trade, how to defend against risk factors, and there's some good ones there, some landmines we'll, we'll uncover, how to time your option for the best bang for the buck, how to gauge ripe high probability opportunities and how to avoid other ones, how to use seasonality to time these trades. Awesome. How about that? That would and, be great. Yeah, how to, how to use relative strength and technicals to time this trade and, and looking for opportunities in real time. Three to four hours of training and value, huh? Three to four hours. Who would not love that? Plus, I'll be using the same trick on a brand new trade alert that I'm going to share with you. So not only are you going to get the education, you're going to get a trade alert. And, and the last time we did this trick, we had a 35% gain like that. All in all, I've literally sold training sessions like this for more than $2,000. I've sold training sessions like this for $10,000. Today, it is not going to run you anything like that. We're on the verge of a complete trading breakthrough where you can have your cake and eat it too. And instead of giving you one trade, we're going to figure out two trades on the second class on Thursday, and we're going to launch those trades. They're going to be bonus trades, but I'm going to give you guys my full seasonality trades. Not just that, special announcement. I've created 13 modules, 13 mod modules of education that I've never, ever, ever published anywhere. If you want to learn about options, implied volatility, all the stuff that we've talked about today, it's all in there. It's worth a lot more than the price that you're going to be getting for this options unlocked at all. So it's, it's a great deal. I believe you'll be, when I say blown away, I mean blown out of the water by this, okay? And, and just to show you I'm a good guy, I'm going to give you a full money back guarantee. All right, full money back guarantee, no questions asked, no monkey business. If after two days you're not happy, call my team, get a refund, no monkey business. Is it going to cost you $2,000? Of course not. I'm not going to insult you here. Not $997, 200 Can you imagine that, Celeste? That's all. For, That's incredible. For three to four hours of my time, $297. <laughs> I honestly can't believe I'm doing this. I Folks. can't believe you're doing it either. Roger, I got to interrupt you. And I just got to say, well, I got to tell everybody, first of all, whenever Roger speaks, I listen. I remember he just, he goes overboard on content and he is the master of master of teachers. I've learned so much from him over the years. I cannot wait to see this new class that he ha you have, Roger, on, on the options because you, you've got that seasonality. You've got all these different type of entry. And as you said, you've been doing this for so long. I cannot wait to see what you've unlocked for us now. So it's going to be a great class. And all those recordings and that, all those, I mean, give me a break. All of it. Now, don't delay. 
I don't want to have too many people because I want to be hands on. Otherwise, we'll be there for two days, for 20 days. It's a limited time offer. We're starting. We're going to lock this up and finalize it next week. It's happening on Wednesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. Don't miss out. Live classes. Now, you had fun with me for 20 minutes today. Imagine what we'll be doing for three to four hours together. I know tons of people are involved already. Your satisfaction guaranteed. Let me show you an easy way to get options at a discount. Anytime you buy an option, you'll save 40, 50, 60, 70%. If that's not worth $297 to you, I don't know what is. Once you sign up, don't close. I'm also going to give you an offer to get about $1,800 off my best educational deal. Intro to Algo, front runner portfolio, plunge protection. All of that's in there. It's only available for people who take me up on my discount options on lock training right now. Don't miss out. The that's discount amazing. options, the options masterclass, the bonuses, you don't want to miss out on this. Do it right now. And I'm telling you, it is going to be fun, fun, fun. Um, it's it's just, sorry, Celeste, go ahead. No, no I was just going to say, man, you're, everybody's mind is just going to be like just going on fire with all the education that they're going to get, all the knowledge that they're going to be able to apply. And that's the key. I know, Roger, because you have you said you're going to show trades, how to like actually get into these positions. And you've got some trades lined up for people, uh, some of your high probability setups. I mean, it's going to be... A this is what you need, everybody, going into this summer. You need to understand how to unlock this potential and be really savvy because there are a lot of sneaky things out there in the markets. It's incredible, Roger. I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, folks, get, get in on this. I'm going to literally give you setups, but not only that, we're literally going to use everything I teach you. We're going to demonstrate by finding two trade opportunities. That So you're going to leave away, not just with a class, but you're going to leave away with two trades. It's happening at 10 a.m., Next Wednesday and next Thursday, it'll be recorded. Stephanie, it'll be recorded so you can watch it till the cows come home. You'll get the recordings in the members area. You'll never lose it, and you can watch it forever and ever. I'm going to show you some cool tools. I'm going to show you some cool tricks, and I'm literally going to talk for three to four hours. I'm going to split it in two days, and if anybody knows me, they know I always over-deliver. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be at 10 a.m. Eastern time both days. Cannot wait to see you there. Thank you, Celeste, for uh, inviting me to Ask the Pros. I love this class. And folks, if whenever we have a class, we always end on a good note. And I'm telling you, and I'm inviting you for next week's session. It's going to be a great one. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be incredible. I remember too, even just last week on Ask the Pros, you know, Garrett was talking about how, how you really have un uncovered all these changes that are in the market. And he's like, yes, this is here and this is permanent. And to be able to hear Roger now talk about how these options and how he's looking at them now with all of these years of experience and with what, everything that he knows about algos, I mean, this you need to add another zero, Roger. I'm telling you, I'm going to like call whoever your publisher is and say, you need to add another zero to this. It's that good. And just as Roger was saying, hey, it's not like it's not like you're going to lose this. You, you're, you're going to get in at this price. This information is going to be yours forever. You're going to be able to access that members area, get that information, listen to it whenever you want to, listen to it multiple times and start applying it. He's going to show you how to apply. He's got two high probability trade setups. He's going to show you. So it's just like you get the opportunity to have Roger hold your hand through some really crazy times in the market. I will not miss it. It's going to be great. Roger, I can hardly wait to be there. Thanks for sharing all this. Thanks for being no, here with us. My pleasure. And as Ken just said, the strategy will, will be able to be, you can apply this to bonds, gold, ETFs, futures, cryptos, commodities. You can apply it to any asset you want that has yeah. options, obviously. So it's very flexible and it's fun. It's not complicated. And I promise it's worth your time. And it's definitely worth $297. Don't okay. miss out. Sign up now and have a yeah. great weekend, everyone. And the power of learning options is unbelievable. I mean, Scott was right there with me in March of 2020 when the market fell down. I was using options in a leveraged way to uh, make my seven figures. So, uh, you know, it's it's a powerful strategy. You know, it's a powerful tool. You should really learn how to use all the different pieces of options and understand all the things he's talking about there. The theta, the implied volatility, you know, 13 modules worth. It's, it's key. The really turbocharging gains in the market is to learn options. Yeah, that's absolutely. right. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I heard there's going to be a everybody. special prize for anyone who gets the banana and the tailpipe reference. Are, will you be giving out? Because 
I don't know if, if, if they deserve something special for that. Cause I love that reference. It's so funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, thank you for posting it, Adam. I was just about to post them. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe we'll make t-shirts or something funny <laughs> like that. You know, I should, I should actually do that. I already have a, uh, uh, no monkey business t-shirt. I should get a banana in the tailpipe business. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love Bye, it. guys. Have thanks. a great weekend. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here with us. We're going to go over to Ask the Pros Premium here. It's going to start right in five minutes. Jack Carter is with me. You're going to love it. He's got an incredible amount of information. You know we love, love, love when when uh, when Jack teaches. So we'll be right over there. I'm going to go over there, get you started, see you right over there. And recordings are at ATP Premium or ATP, ATPTraders.com.